Good afternoon. Let's uh, start with our final topic okay, for the module. Okay, so right now we are uh, closing up. We have covered basically just about all the concepts of, uh, that we need for music processor, your programming, your assembly language, okay, and as well as uh, hardware design. Okay, this last chapter is a bit different from the rest. It's uh, more of understanding what we can do in terms of improving the overall computing system. Okay, so we saw that you can improve a processor from uh, performance from a single cycle to a pipeline. Okay, that helps in one way. So now we're going to look at another important aspect, which is cache. Okay, and why is this important in the overall system? Because if you look at our old our mix processor, the memory access is always the bottleneck in the system. Correct. Even in a pipeline processor, that stage will always take the longest. Okay, to execute. So, this is a issue, correct? Because memory is uh, inevitable. You need a lot of memory, okay, for your program, for your code, for your data, and you need to access this frequently, correct? So, improving your access to memory is critical if you want to improve your overall system, correct? No matter how fast you clock your processor, okay, no matter what speed you can run, at the end of the day, if your memory is slow, your whole system uh, slows down. Okay, so in cache there are a few parts. Okay, so the kind soul being that I am, I've removed the set associative cache, so we're only going to do direct map cache. Okay, so once this is done, that means we have completed the, the overall module. Okay, so these are some of the things we will cover. Okay, so let's uh, recap again what the whole uh, system is actually doing. Okay, so if you think about it. Whenever you're executing program, you are always going to interface with memory. Why? Because you need to fetch your instructions from memory. Okay, so you definitely need to load from memory. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, so as long as you say your processor is executing an instruction, you start off with your memory access. Okay, so that is the first thing. Next thing is after you do your processing, finally, in some cases, you may need to write back to memory. Okay, so in all instructions, you have to fetch from memory, that is your instruction. And in some cases, at the end of the execution, you may need to write back to memory, uh, if you're going to update your memory. So this happens very frequently uh, throughout the execution of your program. Okay, so your load and store instructions pretty much take up quite a high percentage of your overall instructions okay, that you execute. Of course, there are other devices such as input output which we did not look at in this particular module. Okay, so this is just uh, for our own information on the history of memory. Okay, as you can see in the past, uh, memory was uh, not so easily available and quite complex in the sense of uh, having actually memory tubes. Okay, so you can see the amount of hardware just to store 32 17 bit words. Okay, so in the past, memory was really very, very difficult to create because of the technology that was not present at the time. Okay, so of course, along the way, we have improved tremendously. Okay, and currently we are at uh, DDR, okay, in terms of your memory access. Okay, so we say DDR because it is double data rate. Okay, we can basically access the memory on both the positive and negative edge of the clock. Okay, of course, we are not going to end here. Huh? If you think of semiconductor technology, it's always improving. Correct? They're always coming up with the next big thing that will uh, make our life better. Okay, if, it, if you look at hard disk, for example, SSD right now is very popular. But about 20 years ago, that was the hot topic being researched. Okay, all over universities. How to make SSD uh, a, a, a technology that can be delivered to the common man. Correct. So ten, 20 years ago, that was the hot research topic, and now we have it in all our laptops. All right. Similarly, whatever people are researching now, 10 years later, 20 years later, that will become the new norm. Okay. So things will always improve. Okay. So this gives you an idea of the capacity per DRAM chip. Okay. So when you talk about a DRAM chip, that means the actual hardware chip. Okay. How much memory one 
uh, hardware can actually allocate. Okay, so this, of course, very much the technology in terms of the transistor and the electronics that we deal with. Okay, and if you look at the trend, basically you have around four times growth every three years. Okay, so the ability to create more and more memory within a smaller footprint is always increasing. Okay, so the technology is always in increasing to allow us to have more memory in a smaller space. But what is the problem? Okay, the problem is the access time for memory is still very much lagging behind the processor speed at which you are running. Okay, so if you see here, our CPU's ability to perform is growing up at exponential rate. Okay, but our memory is a very gentle linear line. Okay, so because of this, there is a huge gap. Okay, your processor technology is improving rapidly, much far ahead than the memory technology to catch up. Okay, so even though my processor can run so much more faster at gigahertz range, the memory access time okay, is still not improving fast enough. Okay, so that always becomes a huge bottleneck for all our systems. Okay, so when you talk about memory, these are the two main technology. One year ago when we did this module, we actually went into all these details and made students learn how to analyze this kind of circuit, okay, and, uh, and figure out what is the voltage and what is the current, all these points. But you're very lucky that now we remove all of that, all right? So we just show you the picture only. See the picture happy. Okay, you don't need to know anything beyond the picture. Okay, so basically these are two main technologies for memory cells. Okay, one is the SRAM, the other is the DRAM. And SRAM basically we use a lot of transistors. So when uh, transistors basically take up more space, okay? So you have more transistors means your density is low. Okay, because you need more space to build one memory component, you can only pack so many number of memory components within the same chip. Okay, but why is it very uh, advantageous? It is very fast in terms of the access. Okay, so the SRAM though, in terms of density, it is bad, but in terms of access time, it's very good. Okay, on the other hand, we have DRAM, where you only have one transistor and one capacitor. Okay, so since I only have sort of two components which are very, very small, the amount of density that I can pack in is very high. Okay, so I can pack a lot of DRAM cells into the same footprint compared to SRAM cells, okay? But again, there's always a trade-off, correct? So the disadvantage is what? It is slow access, okay? Compared to your SRAM. So you have two different technology, SRAM and DRAM, okay? Which you normally use for your uh, memory storage. Okay, so what are the other types of uh, technology that we have, okay? Your hard disk, okay? So though we have SSD now, many of us may still use this typical uh, uh, hard disk which has a rotating disk, okay? So not everybody has SSD, some of us still have this rotating disk hard disk drive, okay? So this is another sort of uh, storage that we have and that provides even more latency. That means the access time is even slower. Okay, but since it is cheap, you are able to get it at a higher capacity uh, with very low cost. Okay, so you can see that there are different types of memory technology and all of them need to be integrated in the whole system. Okay, so this is sort of give you a, a snapshot okay, of the different memories okay, and where do we stand. So if you think about register, register is also a form of memory, correct? Why? Because whatever I put in my register, whether it's S0 or T0, it holds on to the value, correct? Okay, so the register is also a form of memory, okay? So how much capacity can I have? Very limited because that will directly impact the size of your overall chip, correct? Okay, so the amount of registers I can have is limited. It, there's nothing stopping from a designer to say instead of 32 register in MIPS, I make it 64 register or make it 120 register, all right? I can just put in the hardware, okay? But what's the problem? The problem is then your overall chip price increase, all right? Uh, because I use so much more space. 
So we have to balance it out with a limited number of registers. Then of course you have your SRAM and DRAM, okay? And both of them have their pros and cons. SRAM very fast, but again expensive because of the space. Okay? DRAM is slow, but it's very cheap in terms of the space that it uses. Again, of course, your hard hard disk that you have, okay, you can have a lot of capacity, but again, very, very slow. Okay? And the cost is of course much lower. And of course, this is our ideal situation, correct? We want a lot of memory with very, very low access time and also very low price. And this is of course the ideal situation. Okay, and maybe in a few years' time we may even get to this range. Okay, then this topic can be removed from CS. Um, what, 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 how would the Atmos for state drive affect this memory hierarchy? Okay. For the state drive? Yeah, so solid state drive, where will it be? But the cost is very high. Correct. So hard disk, your SSD also comes as part of this, correct? Where your capacity is high, your latency is going to be low, but your cost is still very high now, correct? Okay? So your SSD is also a form of hard disk, okay? Where you have high capacity with low latency, but currently it is still very expensive, correct? So when technology improves, when manufacturing process improves, then the price goes down. Alright, and the price goes down, then more and more consumers have access to it. Okay, so effectively what we want, we want to be able to be have a big memory, which is also very fast. Okay, so that is not possible throughout the whole system. So we need to have a hierarchy, okay, to sort of differentiate the various levels of access and how I can put everything together. Okay, so this is the overall hierarchy of how everything comes into place. Okay, so at the lowest level, of course, you have your hard disk or your SSD drive, which gives you a lot of space, a lot of storage, okay? But it's still slower. Why? Because it is still an external device. Okay, it's still an external device. Your DRAM and SRAM, again, as you go up, you have some amount of DRAM, some amount of SRAM. So in a computing system, if you look at it, if you open up, a system and you look at the board, you see a lot of chipsets, all right? Okay, those chipsets are all the various subsystems. So there's no such thing as a computing system that is just a chip by itself, no. You need memory, you need I.O., you need a lot of peripheral subsystem. Okay, and in terms of memory subsystem itself, you break it down to various other components like your DRAM, SRAM, registers, and so on. So inside your whole system, you will have some amount of DRAM, you will have some amount of SRAM, okay? And of course, the most limited is the registers, uh, which are directly inside your processor. Okay, so this is where the whole idea of cache comes in, okay? So the whole idea of cache is now, how can I improve the overall access to my memory? So let's look at this analogy using a library, okay? So I don't know whether you all have been to the library, okay? You should know that one exists in the US. Okay? So imagine you are forced to put back a book in its bookshelf before taking another book. So every time you go in, you take one book. I, after I access, then I must put it back first, then I can take another book. Okay? That is very slow, correct? Okay? So every time I go, I only can take one book at a time okay? and read, and after that, I must put it back. So that is currently what we are doing now. Right, imagine the current system that we have. Every time I fetch one instruction, I have to finish the instruction, then the next instruction comes in. Okay? Now, what if you are allowed to take the books that you most likely will need, okay? And then you place them nearby in your desk. Okay? So that will make your life easier, alright? Okay? So if I know that I need to take a few books. Okay, and I'm allowed to take these few books that I'm going to read within the next few hours and keep it all close to me. So I don't need to keep traveling up and down the lane in the library, correct? Okay, so that is the idea of uh, cache. Try to keep data, okay, that is frequently and recently used, okay, in a smaller but faster memory. 
Okay, so all our information, the instructions, the data are in the external memory, correct? Which is now slowing down my system. Right? Because every time I need to go out and do a fetch, then after I finish, I need to go right back. Okay, so now what I'm saying is, if I know that I have this group of memory that I'm going to frequently access, okay? Then why don't I take this and keep it close to me? Okay, so that it's easier. Only when I don't need to access this, then I go out. Okay, so that is the whole idea of cache. Okay? And why does it work? Because of this principle called locality. Okay? In most of our cases, if you look at our code, most of our code has a lot of loops. We have a lot of arrays. Okay, we have a lot of structures with, where data is closely packed together or instructions that are currently executed will also be executed again in a nearby time. Okay? Uh, of course, in some cases, you may just straight through code without any loops, okay? But in general, there will be a lot of loops, there will be a lot of arrays in our code. So we can make use of this to help us to improve our memory access. So in terms of locality, there are three basic types, which are temporal, spatial, and uh, the temporal and spatial. So what is temporal? Temporal is the time. Okay, if I access something now, there's a high chance that within a short time frame, I will access this data again. Okay? And when does this apply? In areas where you have loops or you, where you have an array. Okay? So when, if I'm going through an array, there's a high chance that I may access the elements again and again. Okay? Uh, spatial locality, again, is the time, uh, is the space. Okay? So if I have an array and I'm accessing one element, Chances are I may access nearby elements also, okay, within the array. Okay, so time is when I access a code, there's a high chance I may repeatedly access this code again and again. Same thing for data. Okay, so if you look at this structure, what do you see? For example, this dots here. That means this is something like a loop, all right? I execute from one line all the way to the end of the loop, then I repeat the loop, then I repeat the loop, all right? Then I do some branch somewhere. Okay, and a lot of our code have some kind of pattern like this. Okay, you may have some loop. After you finish some loop, you do an if else statement, you do a branch somewhere, and then you have another loop, or you have to do something else. All right. Similarly, in terms of data, you may access a group of uh, memory element that you have declared. Okay, and this continuous side by side is most likely an array. All right. So there is always data that is packed together. There is always code that is also executed around the same few lines. So now that we know this, okay, that there is always this uh, locality okay, in terms of time and space, okay, what I can do is I can say that I capture what is known as a working set of this locality. Okay, what is a working set? That means I take a snapshot of this access okay, for a limited period of time and I say that within this time frame, for example here, I see that I access certain number of lines of code. In terms of data, I access certain data. Correct? So this is my code, this is my data, and so on. So now that I know that I'm accessing this set of uh, instructions regularly and this set of data regularly, I can now take this to be my working set. That means I try to keep this information close to me. Okay, that means close to the processor so that it doesn't need to keep going out of the processor to the memory and fetching data in. Okay, so the whole concept now is without the cache, okay, your processor is directly talking to memory. Okay, but now what I'm doing is instead of letting the processor directly talk to memory, I go through what is known as a cache. So you can see that your main memory that is holding your variables and uh, your data is in DRAM, whereas your cache we use SRAM. Okay? Again, it's the concept. Why DRAM for your main memory? Because I can have a lot of main memory and it is slow. All right? So to compensate for that slowness, I use a cache which has SRAM. But the cache is more expensive, correct, because of the space. 
so I can have only a limited amount of cash. Okay, so a cash is a small but fast SRAM that is near the CPU. So when we say near the CPU, means what? Okay, so if you try to look at the internal layout of a processor, okay, so let's say this is the processor, you will have your main uh, uh, components, okay, which is your microprocessor. Okay, and then you will have other subsystems, okay, that maybe deal with your input and output, okay, and then you have your memory interface, okay, to connect to your external devices, okay, and this cache is also part of your main memory foot, a uh, main microprocessor footprint, okay. So that means all of this is part of your main chip, your single chip, okay, so. Inside your, so if you take a processor, for example, your, your A9 processor inside your iPhone, and you open it up, okay, and you try to examine exactly what is inside, you will see you have a processor, which is the main A9 processor core, plus you have some of these subsystem, okay, which deal with your memory interface, which deal with your input-output interface, okay, and at the same time, you have a cache that is inside as well, okay, so all of this is built into the processor. Okay, so since we want the processor to be small and compact, we have to be very careful with how much cache we allocate. This DRAM is external. This DRAM is not part of the main processor chip, but the cache is part of the main processor chip. Okay, so that is why we have to be careful to make sure that it is very small in size. Okay, so since it is part of the main processor chip, that is the biggest advantage. Why? Because this interface, okay, here, where I need to go out of the chip, okay, where I need to go out of the chip and get data, that is what slows down the whole thing, correct? Okay, so now that I keep part of this information in the DRAM inside my chip, so I don't need to go outside, okay? So this interfacing to the external DRAM is cut or minimized. So that is why I save a lot of time. Okay, so this cache that is now inside the processor, this is now a direct interface between my processor and cache. Okay, it is not an external device. Okay, so even though we draw like this, this is actually all in one chip. Okay, your memory is external. Your input-output devices are external. Okay, so that is the whole idea. I want to keep some of this information in my DRAM inside the same chip where my processor is. So I cut down on my access time to the external interface. Okay, And this is hardware managed. That means what? That means as far as the programmer is concerned, it is transparent to him. Same thing as pipeline. It is handled by the processor. When you write a code, you do not care whether it's single cycle or pipeline or whatever. You just have the idea that if I write this sequence of lines, it must execute in this sequence of lines. Okay, whether it's pipeline or single cycle, that is secondary to you. Same thing for cache. When I say I want to read from memory, I want to write from memory, I write the load word storage instructions. To me, it is transparent whether the processor got cache or don't have cache. Okay, the hardware must be able to handle it itself, regardless of how the programmer sees it. Okay, so. In terms of cache, okay, so what we are doing now is what? We are trying to keep a copy of the data that is in my DRAM. Okay, I'm trying to take a small copy of it and keep it inside my cache, okay? So now there are two concepts. One is called a hit and one is called a miss. So what is a hit? Okay, so right now, this is one component, this is one chip, and the memory is external. So if I want to read from some data, what will the processor first try to do? The processor will try to see if that data is inside the cache. Right? So at the first level, the processor will always try to read from the cache. Okay? And if what I want is inside the cache, then I say it is a hit. Okay? So what is the advantage if it's a hit? Then I don't need to go outside. Correct? Right? The data that I want is already inside the processor. 
cache. So I do not need to go outside. Okay? So together with the hit, you have a hit rate and hit type. How accurate, how often I hit, and if I hit, how much time do I need to access the cache? Now, if I try to access this data, and then I realize that it is not in the cache, then what will happen? Then I need to go and read from memory, all right? Okay, so of course there's a few different strategies or how you handle the read and write whenever there's a miss, which we will see in a while. Okay, so the whole idea right now we know is, if the data is in the cache, it is a hit. If it is not in the cache, then it is a miss. So if it is a miss, then I need to read from memory. Alright, okay? And when I read from memory, what must I do? I must read from memory and also at the same time, update my cache. Okay? So if you look at the miss, there is a miss rate and miss penalty. And miss penalty is the time to replace cache block plus hit time. Hit time is what? Time to access the cache. So regardless of whether I hit or miss, I still have to factor in the hit time, correct? Because I need to access the cache first to know whether it is inside or not. Okay? So if it is inside, then there is no other time involved. But if it is not inside, then I have to factor in the additional time to access the memory to replace the cache block with new data. Uh, with new data. And obviously, you want your hit time to be much lesser than your miss penalty. Alright? Uh, your hit time is very short because it is part of your uh, main microprocessor chip. Uh, your cache is inside there, so your hit time is very, very short. Okay, and it should be much as small as possible compared to the miss penalty. Okay, every time you need to go out and fetch this new data. Okay, so the average access time can be given as this hit rate multiplied by hit time plus the miss rate multiplied by miss penalty. Okay. Now, just to get an idea of how we can make use of this, let's look at this question. We say that we have a on-chip SRAM cache that has 0.8 nanoseconds access time. Okay, so you have to draw this, you have your microprocessor and you have your cache. Okay. And then I have my DRAM here. Okay. And what does it say in terms of timing? Whenever I access the cache, to do this access, I have 0 0.8 nanosecond. Okay? And the access time of the DRAM is 10 nanosecond. Okay? Now, how high a hit rate okay, do we need to sustain an average access time of 1 nanosecond? So you can see that if I want an average access time one nanosecond, and this is quite close to my cache hit rate, correct? Okay, that means I'm expecting okay a very high hit rate. Okay, in order to maintain a average access time of one nanosecond, correct? Okay, so the amount of miss I can afford is very very low. Correct, based on this target that I want to achieve. Okay, so all I need to do is put this inside my formula here. Okay, so I desire, I let the desired H hit rate be H. Okay, so 0 0.8 times H is this. Okay, this is 0 0.8, and this is the H. All right, and the one minus hit hit rate is one minus H, and the miss penalty is 10 plus 0 0.8. Okay, and I want all of this to be equals to one, which is the one nanosecond here. Okay, so I just put all these numbers into the formula that I have. So the average access time is one nanosecond, and that is equals to hit rate times hit time plus one minus hit rate times the miss penalty. Okay, so when I eventually find what is H. 
I get a heat rate expectation, expectation of 98%. Okay, so when I do an excess in this system, 98% of the time it must be a hit. Okay, only 2% I can afford to miss. Okay, anything more than 2%, then I will not be able to maintain my average excess at 1 nanosecond. Correct? It will be longer. Okay, so that is the whole idea of uh, how we can make use of cache. Okay, so now how to map memory to cache. Okay, so there's a few terminology in the next few slides. Okay, so you just need to be familiarized with what is this terminology. Okay, what are we referring to? Then when we do the example, you, you know how it works. Okay, so the first thing is cache block or cache line. Okay, so this refers to the unit of transfer between memory and cache. Okay, that means what? Whenever I try to access cache, for example, and I say it is a miss. So when I say it is a miss, what must I do? I must replace from main memory to cache, correct? Okay, I must replace from main memory to cache. So how much data do I replace? So I must replace one cache block at a time. Okay, one cache block at a time. So again, just take note of the terminology later, you will see how everything falls in place. Okay, and what is a block size? Okay, one block size is usually one or more words. Okay, so if I say I have a 16 byte block, so that is four words. Okay, one word is four bytes, correct? So again, 32 bytes block, it is eight word. Okay. Okay. Block size has to be bigger than word size. Why? Because the minimum is one word size, correct? And the minimum transaction is always one word. So the block size has to be bigger than the word size. Okay, so let's look at how we can map your main memory to your cache. So in this case, this is the actual address. Okay, the address, full address is 32 bits, correct? Now the full address is 32 bits, but we don't need to look at all the 32 bits. We are now looking at the last few bits. Okay, the last few bits. And how many bits do we look at? We look at based on the number of bytes per block. Okay? So if I say 2 to the power of n byte blocks are aligned to 2 to the power of n byte boundaries. Okay? So in this case, Okay, I have 8 byte blocks. That means 2 to the power of n in n is 3. Correct? So 8 byte blocks means what? That means this is one block. This whole thing is one block. Okay? In one block, okay, I have total of 8 bytes. Okay? In one block, I have a total of 8 bytes. Okay, so you can see that if I have a total of 8 bytes, I look at the last 3 bits to know the exact byte offset within the block. Okay, so in this case, in one block, I have 8 bytes. So 8 bytes means 2 words, correct? Uh, 2 words, word 1 and word 2. Okay, so in this case, okay, you can see that I can break out my memory to 0 to n minus 1 as the offset. This offset tells me what? This offset is the byte offset within the block. Okay? So if I say the offset is 0, 1, 0, then I'm talking about byte 2. Alright? Okay? If the offset is 0, 1, 1, then it is byte 3. Okay? So the last 0 to n minus 1 bits tells me the byte offset within a particular block. Okay? And the remaining blocks, the uh, remaining bits tells me which block number I map to. Okay? So you can see that the upper bits okay, were mapped okay, to a particular block number. Okay, and the remaining bits will tell me within the block which byte I am referring to. Okay. Okay. So again, initially it may look 
confusing. When you try the example, then you see that everything is quite straightforward as long as you know which bit map to which. Okay. So right now we are looking at direct mapping analogy, which basically means that I have exactly one location for one book. Okay. So if I say that I want to determine the location of a book based on the first letter of its title, then every book can only go to one place. Okay? So why direct mapping? That means when I take from the memory and I put into cache, there is only one particular place you can go to. Okay? When I take from memory and I put into cache, this particular data in memory will only map to one particular location in my cache. There is no confusion in that. Okay, it's not that when I read from memory, I don't want to put in cache line one or cache line two. No, okay. In a direct map uh, architecture, every time I read from memory and I want to put this data into cache, it will only map to one place. Okay, how to do the mapping is what we're going to be seeing. Okay, so you can see that now. Okay, when I look at the block number, okay, the block number tells me exactly which block I will map to. Okay, so for example, if I say that my cache now has four lines, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, the last two bits will tell me which cache line I will map to. Okay, so if I look at the address, so if this is the address, okay, this line onwards, okay, Whenever the last two bits zero, I say that is block zero, correct? Okay. So as the address is running, the last two bits will be zero for every four location, correct? Uh, every four location, the last two bits will become zero again, zero again. So the next time it is zero, zero, it will also map to cache zero. Okay. The next time it is zero, zero, it will also map to cache line zero. Okay. Same thing for the rest. Okay. If I'm in cache line 0, 1, I'll map to here. The next last two bits, 0, 1, I'll also map to here. Okay? So in direct map cache, every single address location can only map to a single line in the cache. Okay? It will not map to anywhere else. Okay? So what do we observe? The last m bits of the block number is the cache. Okay, so this is the m bits of the block number. Okay, so this is the this inside this block there are other bits. So actually there are other bits over here that tells me the offset within the block. Okay, so if this is three bits, okay, so maybe this is zero zero zero. This zero 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 which is inside here will tell me I'm talking to byte zero. Okay, so inside this block number, okay, you first have the index, okay, which is this, okay, the cache index. Then there is another three, another few bits here that tell me within the block which byte I'm talking to. Okay, so if I come back to this picture, you can see that the last few bit tells me the offset of exactly the byte inside the cache line. Okay, so if it is zero, it is byte zero. If it is four, it is byte four, and so on. Okay, so those are the last few bits. Then the ins as part of the block number, I now take the last few bits of the block number. Okay, the last m bits of the block number is now the cache line. Okay, so after I know the offset, then the another few bits I reserve for the cache line. Okay, so which line am I referring to? Okay, so if it is zero zero, it is line zero. Zero one, it is line one, and so on. Okay. So in terms of a mapping function, you now have a tag number, which is the remaining bits. Okay. So let's look at the next slide, okay, which gives you a better idea of what we are trying to do. So we started off with this, 
Okay, we started off with this where we say that we have a full 32 bit address and the last n bytes tells me the offset. Okay, so if I look at the cache, okay, if I say my cache has two words, okay, so this is word 0 and this is word 1. So inside here I have 4 bytes, here also 4 bytes, alright? Okay, the offset tells me exactly which byte I'm talking to. Okay, which byte I'm referring to. Next, I have another few bits that I set aside that tells me the index. This index tells me, is it line 0, line 1, line 2, line 3 and so on. Okay, so the remaining few bits first tells me which line I'm talking to. Okay, am I talking to the cache line 0, cache line 1, cache line 2 and so on. Okay, and then the last remaining bits make up my, what is called the tag. So the tag, okay, together with the index will tell me exactly the mapping between a location in the memory to a location in the cache. Okay, the tag and the index together will map any location, okay, in the main memory to a location in the cache. Then once I map, the offset will tell me inside the cache which byte I'm talking to. Okay, so this is the idea of the direct cache mapping. Okay, so I will stop here. Okay. Uh, we will revisit this again, okay, and next week, remember Tuesday is holiday, okay, so we will see you, I will see you all on Wednesday, okay. Uh, so don't worry, uh, like I said, initially all the terminology and numbers may seem a, a bit confusing, but when we do the example, then you see it's actually not so bad. And when you look at the example, it's a bit more straightforward. Okay, good afternoon. Let's get started. Okay, so after last week's uh, initial lecture on cash, there were quite a lot of questions, so I think I will just make sure I recap uh, what we covered last, uh, last week so that we clear all the doubts and misconceptions that we have. Okay, so the whole idea of cache, as we saw, is the bottleneck okay, caused by the memory system. Okay, so in any uh, computing system, no matter how fast your processor is running, okay, you're clocking it at gigahertz range and so on, but eventually the bottleneck is always at the memory system because your memory is still much slower to respond okay, compared to how fast you can actually process the data. Okay, so that is the problem, correct? So, of course, we can solve it over time when memory technology itself improves, okay? So, when there is new research, new breakthrough in memory technology, then that will help us. But currently, one of the ways in which we are overcoming this is through a hardware sort of improvisation where we have a cache within the processor, okay? So, inside the processor, okay? What we do is we now have an additional set of registers, okay, called cache. And the whole idea of the cache is to hold on to data that is frequently accessed. Okay, that is frequently accessed. And the reason why this works is because of the locality principle that we saw. That means in terms of space and in terms of time. If I access some data currently, there's a high chance the next, uh, within the next few clock cycles, I will access data that is somewhere nearby. Okay, that is one principle. And the other thing is time. If I execute this instruction now, chances are I may execute this instruction again over time. Okay, so of course it doesn't always happen. Okay, so that's why we have a hit and we have a miss. Okay, so if it happens that the data is within the locality, then when I try to get it and it's in the cache, there is a hit. If it is not, I take a branch instruction or a jump instruction, I go to some place new, never executed before, never accessed the data before, then it will be a miss. Okay? So, of course, generally, uh, in most cases, because of the structure of our programs where we have a lot of loops, 
you have a lot of uh, arrays and structures of data packed together. Uh, the cache actually does help us a lot. Okay, so that is the whole idea of having a cache inside a computing system. Okay, so this is what we saw last week. Okay, so I think this is where the confusion sort of started, where we started to have uh, the terms in place of the different aspects of cache. Okay, so the first thing that we look at is the cache line or cache block. Okay, so when you say cache line, that means in one line, how much, uh, that means at any point of time, how much data can I transfer from the memory into my cache? Okay, uh, when does this transfer happen? If I incur a miss, okay, that means if I try to access a data and it's not in my cache, so I need to go out to the main memory to transfer this data into my cache, okay? So every time I go out to my main memory, I cannot just go and grab one byte from some random location. There is a minimum size I need to grab and come. Okay, so that minimum size of data that I need to grab from the memory into my cache is called the cache block or cache line. Okay, so whenever I try to access my data in the cache, and I see it's not there, so I need to physically go out to the main memory, grab some data and come in, okay? And this amount of data that I take from main memory every time is fixed. Okay, and that is a line in cache or a block in cache. So that is the first term we need to be comfortable with. How big is this line is up to us to define when we design the cache. Okay, uh, so when you are, if you are asked to design a cache or you're given a cache with certain specification, it can vary. Okay, so in, in this for example, you can have a 16 byte block. Okay, so if I have 16 byte block means, that means in one cache line, I have a total of 16 bytes. 16 bytes means four words. Okay, so word zero, word one, word two, word three. Okay, so in this situation, if there is a miss and I go out to fetch data in, then every time I have to fetch 16 bytes in. Okay, even though I only want to access one byte and the one byte is a miss, it doesn't matter, I still have to fetch the full 16 bytes in. Okay, so you can have a lot of variations, there is no strict formula. So if I say I have a 32 byte block, then I have eight word blocks. That means each line as eight words of data. Okay, so every time I need to move data, I need to move it in eight words. Okay, why is block size bigger than word size? Because the minimum you're looking at is word. Correct, so minimum I need to have at least one block to be one word. Uh, that is the smallest sort of access that we're looking at. Okay, even though we may have byte, load byte, or store byte, the load byte and store byte still does not take one byte at a time. It still takes a word but gives you back one byte. Okay, it still takes a word but gives you the byte that you asked for. Okay, so the minimum is still one word size. Okay, so now let's look at this uh, example here. So how do we do the mapping between the cache and the memory? So the cache, think of the cache as a reduced subset of the main memory. Okay, reduce subset of the main memory. So imagine this is my whole main memory here, okay? This whole chunk here, okay? And all of this memory, which is uh, in two to the power of 30, that means the entire range is what? Zero to two to the power of, so, sorry. So I have total of two to the power of 32 different bytes, okay? Okay, or equivalently, to the power of 30 words, okay, inside my total memory. Okay, that's the total amount of data I can store. And I want to create a cache that copies this data, okay, but keeps a small subset of it near my processor, okay? So how much data I can copy depends on how much cache space I have, okay? So some of you ask, why don't I just create a very big cache? Okay, then it's equivalent to saying the memory is part of your processor, correct? Uh, it's, it's equivalent to saying that your processor and your memory joined together become one super chip. Okay? So obviously, we do not want that. 
Uh, again, why we, we are, what we are trying to do is, we know we need a lot of memory, correct? We need a lot of memory, but the memory access is slow. So what I want to do is, keep a subset of the memory close to me, close to the processor. So since I can only keep a subset, you have a question? There is no fix because MIPS is an open one, so there is no fix. So later in the example, you will see in the tutorial also you will see some examples. Okay, so you can have 32 byte, uh, 32 kilobyte cache, 16 kilobyte cache. Uh, in fact, in this set of slides, we are only thinking of cache as a single entity. In most processors, cache is actually a separate instruction cache and data cache. Okay, that means instructions that are fetched separately are kept in a separate cache and data that is fetched regularly is kept in a separate cache. Okay, so in reality, cache can have multiple variations of design. Okay, so there is no formula depending on, on what is your need, what is your hardware constraint you have. Okay, so coming back to this, now I have two to the power of 30 words in my main memory and I want to map it to a cache which is a reduced subset. How big is this? Depend on your size. So in this case, what do we have? We know that if I just look at this picture here, I say that one cache line or block is equivalently uh, two words. Correct? Uh, because I have one word here, okay, one word here, and another word here. Okay, so total is how many? So total is eight bytes of data in one cache line. So if I have eight bytes of data in one cache line, that means the lower three bits, okay? So the lower three bits, okay, will be used to tell me exactly which byte I'm referring to whenever I bring in this line of data, correct? Okay, so I know that every time I need to fetch data from memory to my cache, I need to fetch eight bytes of data, correct? But it's not, I'm not interested in all the eight bytes. I may be interested in only one byte or one word. Okay, so the offset and uh, this three last three bits will tell me exactly which byte I'm uh, referring to or which word I'm referring to. Okay, so that is the first thing, which is your byte offset. Okay, so the last n bits, zero to n minus one, tells me exactly which byte I'm referring to once I fetch a line into my cache. Okay, and then the remaining bits tells me the block number. Okay, so this block number has to be further divided into a cache line index as well. Okay, so this is the first thing. So the first thing you must know is the last few bits tells me the byte offset. Okay, so within the line, which byte I am interested in. Now, the block number, we're going to divide it some more. And we're going to say that the block number, the remaining bits after the byte offset has two parts to it. One is called the cache index, okay, which tells me exactly which line I'm referring to. Okay, so in this cache, Okay, so for example, if I'm following the same example as just now, in one block, I have two words, word zero, word one. Okay, in one line, I have two words. Okay, so these two words can, or these eight bytes can be differentiated using the last three bits of my address, correct? I use the last three bits of my address, I can know which byte I'm referring to within the cache line. Now, how do I know which line I'm going to map to? Okay, how do I say that this goes to line zero? And this goes to where? Line one, how do I decide that? Okay, so what we're trying to do is trying to come up with a mapping. Okay, because the cache is a reduce version of your main memory. So I must have a proper way of mapping. So that I know that if I try to access this line, 
in memory, it translates to a particular line in the cache. Okay, I'm trying to come up with the proper way to do a mapping. So the best way to do it, okay, or in this case, since we're doing direct map cache, the bits after the byte offset. So how many bits I need depends on how many lines I have in my cache. Okay, so since I have four lines, I need two bits to indicate the cache line that I'm interested in. Okay, so these two bits that immediately follow, okay, tell me exactly which line in the cache it will map to. Okay, so you can see that for the same cache last few bits, okay, which is the byte offset, I can have different line, correct? Okay, so over here, for example, if I look at the last uh, eight, last three bits here, for example, I say this is zero, I'm looking at byte two. Inside here as well, there will be a byte two, correct? Okay, because the last three bits will keep repeating, correct? Okay, but what will be different? Okay, now both of them will map to the same block zero, all right, if the last, if the next two bits are zero. So if I look at this, this also map to zero, this also map to zero, all right? Okay, so when the last three bits are changing and the next two bits are also changing, but the next two bits tell me which line I map to. If the next two bits are different, okay, so the zero, one, zero, for example, byte two will keep repeating. In the case where the next two bits are different, okay, if I look at these two bits, if the next two bits are different, then I know they map to different line, correct? Okay, so if I look at the first and the second line here, okay, byte two, which is the last three bits, will be applicable in the first block and in the second block as well, okay? But when I look at the next two bits, I know that the first line is going to map to line zero, and the next line is going to map to line one. Okay, so I can differentiate to know where it will map to. Okay, so that is the first thing. Okay, to set aside a certain number of bits after the byte offset to know which line in the cache I'm going to map to. Okay, so. Again, since I have M blocks or M lines, I need to set aside that number of bits. So if I have four lines, then I have two bits. Okay, now the last thing is the concept called tag. Okay, so let's look at this again. So if let's say now I'm interested in byte uh, three. So, the, so inside each block here, okay, inside each block here, the numbers will run from 0, 0, 0 all the way to 1, 1, 1, correct? That is the last three bits which tell me the byte offset. Okay, same thing. Every block, I will run the same thing, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. So if I'm interested in, let's say, byte 3, okay, if I'm interested in byte 3, that byte 3 will come here, that the last three bits will appear everywhere. Okay, and that is my byte offset okay now when I look at the next two bits they tell me which line this address maps to so if the next two bits is for example 0 0 then I say it map to cache line 0 okay if the next two bits is 1 0 then it map to cache line 2 Okay, but what if the next two bits is also zero, zero? Okay, so if the next two bits is also zero, zero, then how do I differentiate? Okay, so that is where the remaining bits come in. You will see that the remaining bits will now be unique for every address line. Okay, will always be unique for every address line. So that is called the tag number. Okay, so the upper bits will always be different for the same mapping to the cache line. 
So that helps me to differentiate and know whether this line in memory already is stored in cache. Uh, so we start with the lowest number of bits, uh, the n bits, to tell me the byte offset. Then we move up to a few more bits to tell me which line. Okay, and then the remaining bits is what we call the tag. And the tag is unique. Okay, that means once I say that this address line, this is the tag, this is the index, and this is the offset, it forms a unique address already, correct? So using these three sets of information, I will know whether the data in my cache is already from the memory or is it from a different address that I need to now fetch from memory. Okay, so just be familiar with these terms. When we go through the example, then you see how everything falls in place. Okay, so this is the overall picture. Huh? So the last few bits is your offset, okay, followed by your index, and finally your tag. I just remember these three terms offset, your index, and tag. Offset is the byte within the cache line, okay, index is which cache line, and tag is the remaining bits that help me to uniquely identify every line in memory. Okay, so this is how you look at it. Okay, so the cache that we have, okay, so first thing is we need to map the address. Alright, okay, so we need to check whether the address that I'm trying to fetch data from, uh, is there a match, okay, within the cache. And then I also need to store the data associated with this memory, correct? Uh, the whole idea is, in each address location, there is some data which I want to access. So this data uh, must also be stored inside my cache. Okay, so the cache itself has the tag, which is the remaining bits, followed by another bit called a valid bit. This bit is important because it tells us whether the cache line contains valid data. Okay, what do you mean by valid data? That means it has already been loaded with data from the cache. Okay, uh, so if it is not valid, then you cannot read from it. Okay, so when do we consider it a cache hit? If the address that I want, okay, is already inside the cache and the valid bit is set. Okay, so let's look at example and we get a better understanding. Now, let's look at this main memory here. So, this main memory here is 4 gigabytes. Okay? And what do we say? We say that we want to have one block equals to 16 bytes. Okay? So, one block 16 bytes means every time I want to fetch, okay, from this memory, I need to fetch 16 bytes at a time. Okay? So, for the 16 bytes, I need 4 bits for my N. Correct? Okay, so that's the first thing you must know. Now let's look at the cache. The cache is 16 kilobytes okay, of space that I have in cache. So again, this is just a random number. It could be 32 kilobytes, it could be 64 kilobytes. Okay, up to the designer to make a decision. So in this case, we have 16 kilobytes as the cache size. So how many lines of cache uh, can I have? Okay, so the each line is 16 bytes, correct? One cache block is one cache line. Okay, that means total number of lines that I can have is 16 kilobyte divided by 16 bytes. Okay, so you have to imagine that in my cache, every time I fetch one line, that one line has 16 bytes of data, correct? Okay, and the total cache size I have is 16 kilobyte. Uh, the total cache size that I currently have is 16 kilobyte. Okay, so to be able to access all these different lines of information in the cache, I need a total of 10 bits. Alright, uh, 16 kilobyte divided by 16 byte is 1024. That means I need total 10 bits to
to be able to differentiate all these lines in cash. Okay, so that gives me my cash index M. And whatever is remaining will be your tag. And the remaining bits in your address. So 32 minus the cash index M minus the byte offset N. Okay, so that gives you the cash tag. Okay, so how does the whole internal circuitry looks like? Okay, so when I want to fetch something from a, uh, something from memory, what will I do? Okay, I will first need to so the the data the address is thirty two bits, correct? So this full address that I'm having is thirty two bits. Now, when I say that I want to read from a thirty two bit address, okay? So I want to know that. I want to check whether this data has already been copied into my cache, correct? Right? Because the whole idea is if the data is already in my cache, then I don't need to read from memory. Okay, so the first thing is I want to check whether there is a data in from this address already in my cache. So how do I reconcile these 32 bits? From the 32 bits, I take out the tag. So in this, so I take out the index. So in this case, I know my index is 10 bits. Why? Because I have 0 to, I have total of 1, 0, 2, 4 cash lines, correct? Okay, so the index gives me the 10 bits, which tells me the cash line that I'm interested in. So I check, take the 10 bits and know which line I'm referring to. Okay, so let's say now it's referring to line 2. Next, what do I do? I check whether the valid bit has already been set. Okay, so inside my cache structure, uh, I need to have a valid bit for each line. This valid bit tells me whether the data in the cache is already updated from memory. Okay, or is it still empty? So if the valid bit is set, then what do I do? I next look at the tag. Okay, the tag tells me the remaining bits. Okay, so in this case, the remaining 18 bits I compare with the tag that is already stored in the cache. So inside the cache, what must I store? I must store the valid bit, I must store the tag, which is the remaining bits in the address, then I must also store the data. Okay, so this is the data that we're interested in. Okay, but what we need to do is we need to check whether the address matches the address already in the cache. So how do I know that? I look at index and look at tag. Okay, so I check for the index. That tells me the line. And in that line, I check whether the value bit is set. And then I look at the tag, which is the remaining bits, and I compare with the tag already in the cache. If these two conditions are met, maybe these two conditions are true, then we say it is a hit. So if it is a hit, what does it mean? It means that the data in the cache is valid. That means before this instruction, there was a prior instruction that also fetched data from either a similar address or an address around this address. Correct? Why? Because of your locality. Correct? Okay? The locality principle tells us that even the data nearby will also cause the cache to be filled. Uh, you will see that in a while. Okay, so the cache would be valid if I have already fetched from the same address before, or it could be because I fetched from an address that is nearby before. So if it is valid and it's a hit, that means this data is already data from the memory copied over to my cache. So I do not need to go out to my memory for this. I can straight away take the data that is in the cache and then do what? Use my byte offset. So my byte offset tells me exactly which byte I'm interested in and then I can use a multiplexer to give me the data that I want. Okay, so that is the internal structure of the whole uh, cache. Okay, so now let's look at uh, some example okay, with some addresses. So we have an idea of how the sequence works. 
Okay, so now we are given 16 byte blocks times 1024 cache blocks. Okay, so what does this mean? When you see this line, you must have a picture of how the cache looks like. That means 16 byte blocks means in one line, I have total of 16 bytes. Okay, total is 16 bytes. 16 bytes is equivalent to two words, correct? And no, four words, sorry. So word 0, word 1, word 2, word 3. And I have a total of 1024 cache blocks. Okay, that means the total size of this is 0 all the way to 1023. So that is how your cache looks like. Okay, in each cache line you have 16 bytes of information and you have a total of 1024 cache lines. Okay, and now we are trying to access the memory at these following addresses. Okay, so these are just some addresses, and now we're going to see how this will actually behave with this current cache. The behavior is different at uh, the moment the cache changes. Okay, if suddenly the cache now from 16 byte become 8 byte block, then of course everything will change. Okay, from 1024 line become 512 lines, again everything will change. Okay, so the cache will play a part in how your uh, access uh, behaves or your performance be, uh, behaves. Okay, so of course, when you first start up a system, your cache is empty, right? So initially, all the valid bits, uh, so you can see here, all the valid bits are zero. Uh, so when the first system start up, okay, all valid bits are zero. Uh, that means the, the data inside cache is so empty, considered empty. Now, the first instruction says I want to do a load from this address. Okay, so what do we do? We check. So what is the first step? We check the index, okay, against the index in the cache and see whether the valid bit is set. So since this index is a 1, we check line 1. Okay, and then we see the valid bit. The valid bit is 0, correct? And the valid bit is 0. So if the valid bit is 0, what does it mean? That means the data is currently not yet updated. Okay, from memory. So this is 0. Okay, so that is considered a cold miss. Okay, a compulsory miss. Okay, so the data in block 1 is invalid. So it's a cold miss or compulsory miss. Then what do I do? I load the 16 uh, bytes from memory. So since the index line already tell me that the valid bit is false, there is no need to check the tag anymore, correct? Yeah. I only proceed to tag, check the tag if the valid bit was set. Okay, since in this case, it already said it's invalid, so I don't need to waste additional time. I can straight away load the tag bits okay, into my cache. The tag bits are the remaining bits on the address line. Take a copy of that and put inside my tag section in my cache. Okay. Next, what do I do? I load the 16 bytes of data from the memory into my cache and I update my valid bit to be 1. Okay, so this is a miss, a cold miss. A cold miss is when your valid bit is. Zero. So that means the first time I am having a mapping to a particular address line. Okay, so in that case, I copy the tag information from this address that I'm trying to read to my cache, and at the same time, copy the data from the memory into my cache, and then set the valid bit to one. Okay, so that is the first thing when you're trying to fill up the cache. Okay, so you have some. Uh, four words of data here. Now, the next instruction is to read from this address. So this second address, what will we do? We will check again that the index is 1. So previously, ah, sorry. so this first instruction, we're supposed to read a byte offset of what? 4, correct? 
byte offset of 4. So this byte offset of 4 lies inside word 1. So the data in space B, which is byte 4 to 7, will be returned back to my processor. Okay? So again, coming back to this picture, Okay, so just now what happened? We try to read. Okay, we try to read from the cache. Okay, we try to do this. We try to read from the cache, but then it wasn't in the cache, correct? Okay, so what did we do? We take the data from memory, load it back to the cache, correct? And then we set the valid bit. But then the data in the cache still must go to the processor, correct? Uh, because you're executing the instruction to say I want to read from the memory. So after I read from the memory into my cache, I still need to copy it back to my processor. Okay, so that is what uh, we just did. Okay, so currently we are still in the first first line here, which is to read from the this particular address okay so let me repeat huh? so the first thing we do is we check the index okay and for this index one we say that the valid bit is set to zero so since the valid bit is zero i need to check the tag so i take a copy of the tag put it inside at the same time read the contents from the memory and put it into my cache and once i put it into my cache i look at the offset so in this case, the offset is 4, okay? So since the offset 4 lies in this word, the word is returned to the processor. Okay, so this word is returned back to my processor, okay? So even though I only request to read one word, I still copy four words uh, because that is the minimum size based on the cache line. Okay, so every time I read four words, but out of the four words, only one will be transferred back to my processor. The rest still in my cache. Okay? And why is this good? Because of the locality. That means there's a high chance that if now I'm reading word 1, which is B, there's a high chance that I may be reading word 2 or word 3 again Okay, in the near future. So let's look at the next instruction. In this next instruction, index 1 is valid. Correct? So index 1 is valid. Okay, so this is the second instruction. Okay. So in this second instruction, the index is also one. So when the index is one, I see that it's already valid. So when it's valid, what do I do? I check that the tag matches. Tag is zero, this tag is also zero. Correct? Uh, so the line is valid, the tag matches that means the data is already in my cache okay so in this second instance this second instruction i do not need to read from memory the data is already in my cache so the offset is what 12 so 12 refer to word d uh, this word here okay so this is the spatial locality okay so since there's a high chance that data that I access currently, there's a high chance I will access data that is nearby. All right? So that is why when I have a cache line of forward, it actually helps me. All right? Because there's a high chance that I may be accessing nearby words in the future. Okay? So again, of course, you may think, why don't I have a cache line of then 16 words? Okay, so again, that adds on to your cache size, correct? Uh, so it's a, a trade-off between the size that you can afford uh, within the processor space that you have. Okay, so in this second instruction, you see that spatial locality helps us, and I do not need to access memory. Uh, data is already in my cache. Okay, so let's look at this. Now this is the third instruction. Now this is the third instruction. In this third instruction, again, I check the index. So this index is 3. Okay, so line 3. 
So in line 3, what do you see? The valid is 0. Okay, the valid bit is 0. That means there is currently no valid information inside my cache. So what do I need to do? I need to then copy the tag information and at the same time copy the data from the memory into my cache. Okay, so now I have a new set of data coming in in a new line. Okay, and of course once I do that, this is uh, byte 4, so this data must then be transferred to my processor. And from the cache, I transfer it to my processor. Now let's look at instruction 4. In instruction 4, uh, I check that it's index 1, okay, and it is valid. Okay, so it's index 1, it is valid, but the tag don't match. The previous tag was 0, this tag is tag 2, alright? Okay, this is tag 2. So since the tag doesn't match, okay, that means this data is holding, this line is holding data from a different memory, correct? Okay, so again, let's look back at the diagram. Okay, so this is what is happening now. Okay, we have a match, okay, with one particular original uh, tag, okay, but now uh, we one uh, index, cache line index, but then the tag now doesn't match, correct? Why? Both of them will map to the same place. This will also map here, this will also map here. Okay, so even though the index is the same, the tag is different. And the upper bits are different. So these upper bits and these upper bits are different. Okay, so that is what is happening. Why is there overlap? It has to be, correct? Again, because we're not doing a copy of 30, uh, your full 30, 2 to the power 30 words over to your uh, processor space. We are only doing a subset. So there will definitely be lines where there will be overlap. So this is a case of where your index matches, but your tag is different. Okay, but both of them map to the same line. Are uh, mapped to the same line. So that is why that now we have a conflict. Okay, so how do we deal with this? Okay, I want to read from a new memory location. Okay, and this current memory location, this cache line in the cache already has data from a previous access, correct? But it's from a different cache line, a different line in memory. So what must I do? So this is a conflict. Uh, so this is what we call a conflict miss. Okay? Why is it a conflict miss? Because the cache already has valid data. But this valid data is from a different address. It's not from the address that I want. So since it is not from the address that I want, I have no choice. I have to now consider this a miss and now replace the cache line. I replace the cache line. So I copy the tag information back in and I copy a new set of data in. Okay, new set of data in, and then I look at the offset. Okay, the offset is 8, so the word 2 will be transferred to the processor. Okay, so this shows you a situation where you have already accessed memory, you have taken the trouble to update the cache, but now a new memory access says I need to replace this cache line with new data. Okay, so now I have replaced this cache line 2 with new data uh, from a different memory location. Okay, now let's look at instruction 5. This instruction 5 is looking at again index 1. Okay, so again it's index 1. It is also valid, but now what do you see? It is again having a conflict miss because this is a tag 0 and this is a tag 2. The earlier, yes. Yes. So it has to replace. So since there is a mismatch, it has to go through the whole thing again and mismatch. Okay? So you can imagine that if, let's say, you keep jumping between two instructions at different addresses that map to different, that map to the same cache line, then every time your cache will miss, correct? Now every time your cache will miss, then I keep replacing, replacing, replacing. Okay? So again, I will, in this case, same as before, I have a conflict miss, I replace the tag with the new tag, take the data and copy it again, and after that, I take the offset, which is byte 0, which is word 
zero and transfer it to my processor. So this gives you an idea of a whole uh, process. Huh? So again, cache, uh, you can write cache that, you can write code that will be very good uh, in terms of mapping to the cache, okay? Or if a compiler is very smart, they can make sure that it maps to the cache structure. Because cache is something that's transparent to us, correct? When you write the software, it is transparent, okay? So if you have a compiler, or if some way you have some information on the cache, then you will know that there is a difference between the performance between different sets of code. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the summary, okay? So, whenever I try to read from the processor, I check whether is it in cache. If it's already in cache, that means I check whether they are both valid. If it's a read hit. Okay, so read hit means your tag and your valid bit are both set. Okay, in that case, no problem. I can take the byte that I want and send it back to my processor. If it's a miss, that means either the valid bit is not set or the tag has a mismatch, then I have no choice but to access at memory, okay? And after I access from memory, then I copy over to my cache line, and then I load the uh, data back to my processor, okay? So these are the steps that you need to be wary about. Okay, good evening. Uh, welcome to a very happy lecture, because it's the last lecture. Okay, so uh, as mentioned, this today is the last lecture. All right, after that there's no more. Tomorrow there's no lecture. Okay, so today again this topic uh, only a few more slides left, so we should finish it in about uh, maximum 20, 25 minutes. And after that, I will go through the exam review slides again one more time and reiterate some of the questions that some of you have been asking. Okay, and after that. Okay, uh, that's the end. Those who want to leave can leave. Then I will go through tutorial 10. Okay, because I, I feel it was a bit of a rush. I have too many questions. So I would like to go through uh, again in class today so that you understand how the solutions uh, work. Okay, so let's uh, finish up the chapter on cache. Okay, so this, uh, again, due to time constraint, we have stopped at this uh, direct map cache. Actually, there's also variations to cache, uh, which we have not covered, which is also known as set associative cache, okay, and other types of uh, design. Okay, so the whole idea of different types of cache is again uh, trying to improve the overall performance, just like how a single cycle mix processor, we uh, make it a pipeline. So a cache from a direct map cache, we can improve the performance by making it a set associative cache, okay, and there are also other designs for cache. So those are not covered, so they will not be tested, but if you're interested, you can go and read up, okay, on your own. So just to summarize where we uh, stopped last week, okay, we were going through these examples of reading data, okay, uh, having a sequence of read instructions, and we saw that whenever we have a read operation, we need to check, okay, whether the index, okay, matches any, uh, for the index that is specifying the address, we go and check the index line in our local cache, and then we see whether it is valid, okay? And at the same time, we also check the tag. Okay, this tag must also match the tag that is currently in the cache block. So if all of this come together, then we say that the data is in the cache, okay? And the data in the cache can then be transferred to the processor. If the data is not in the cache, because it's either invalid or the tag that is mismatched, okay, or there is no entry at all in the cache, then you need to load from the memory into the cache, and then you transfer from the cache to the microprocessor. So this is the whole summary that we saw. So whenever I want to read from a particular address, I always check whether it is in the cache. If it is a hit, that means the data is in the cache, I use the offset, which tells me which byte or which word I'm referring to, and that data is transferred to the processor. In the event that there is a miss, then I need to allocate the memory at the read address, that means read from the memory, then copy it to my cache, okay, uh, I'll allocate the cache line, and then load into the cache line as well, and at the same time, 
deliver data to the processor. Okay, so these are things that happens when I read the data from memory. So in terms of cache miss, okay, there are basically three types of miss. Generally, we say compulsory miss, which is the first time you try to access the block. Okay, so uh, we also call it a cold start. Okay, that means we try to uh, check whether there's an entry in the cache and then realize there is nothing inside because it is a cold start. Okay, so that is a compulsory miss. Conflict miss is when you already have some data, okay, but then there is a mismatch, generally because of the tag that is different. Correct? Okay, index points to the same line, okay, a valid line, but then the tag is different, so you have a conflict miss. Okay, uh, capacity miss is when blocks are discarded. Okay, so this is uh, a special case. We don't need to worry about this. So these are the two main cases that we need to uh, be aware of: compulsory miss and conflict miss. Okay, which we have seen some of the examples in the tutorial. Also, you have seen some examples. Okay, so let's look at another exercise here. Uh, we have a main memory of four gigabyte. Okay, and we say that one block is eight bytes. Okay, and in this case, we have a cache of 32 bytes, and one block is 8 bytes. Okay, so as I said before, there is no fixed design. In the tutorial question, you can see uh, we have a question that says one word is 16 bits. Okay, normally we say MIPS is one word is 32 bits, but in the tutorial, one question says one word is 16 bits. So the question can have any sort of specification on the microprocessor configuration as well as the cache configuration. Okay, so there's nothing fixed here. You need to read the question to understand what exactly is the microprocessor and memory interface and how is the cache being designed. So in this case, we have a four gig memory with one block being eight bytes. And at the same time, we have a cache that 32 bytes and at the same time, one block is eight bytes. Now, how do I come up with the setup information? So we know that I have 8 bytes, so the offset in this case is 3, all right? Uh, since I need to be able to specify exactly which byte I am referring to, okay? So the block number basically is the remaining 29 bits, okay? So from the block number, I now need to break it up into the cache index and cache tag. Now, cache blocks, how do I get four? It is total number of cache bytes that I have divided by number of bytes per block. Okay, so this gives me the number of cache blocks. Okay, so if I have four cache blocks, four cache blocks equivalent to four lines. So if I have four lines, I need two bits to select the four lines, correct? Okay, so the cache index or M is two. Now the remaining bits will then be my cache tag. Okay, the valid bits, the tag bits are separate from this. This is telling you just the data only. Okay? So this is telling you exactly how I interpret the address to map to a cache line. The cache structure itself is uh, data together with the tag and valid bits. Okay, correct or not? See, nobody says it's wrong. This one is what, 26. I put one mistake there, so I'll shake it. Total must be 32, correct? Huh? So total is 32 bits, so cache tag is 26 bits. Okay, so again, just to answer the question again, if you go back to this picture, you can see that your cache actually has more information than just the data, okay? This separating the address into the tag, index, and byte is for me to look at a particular address like this and tell me exactly where to look for and to decide whether the information in the cache is valid. But inside the whole cache block, what do I need? I need to have a valid bit. I need to have tag bits. 
Okay, how many tech bits I have it depends on how I design the cache and then the actual size for the data. Okay, and how many lines of uh, cache lines I have. Okay, so the total cache is the data that I can hold together with all this additional information. So when we say this, okay, this information here is only referring to the data. Okay, when we say there's a cache size of 32 bytes, we are only saying that this is to hold the data. Do not include the tag information, the valid information all inside here. Uh, this 32 bytes is only the 32 bytes of data that I'm going to hold. Uh, we do not factor in the tag bits, valid bits, and all other additional information for the cache operation. Okay, so now we are going to load these following, or load from these following addresses, okay? And we are told that each word is four bytes, okay? And each of this uh, data that we see A, B, whatever alphabet is equivalent to a word size data. That means we treat each of this alphabet as a word size data. Okay, so let's look at the first uh, access. The first access is at address four. Okay, so when I read from address 4, the very first time that I read, definitely it's going to be a miss, all right? Uh, because you have a cold start. So it's a cold miss, definitely you have to read from the memory and load into cache. Okay, so now let's look at the address. The address says that this is the how the address line looks like. So based on our design just now, we know that this maps to index 0 and tag 0. Okay, so index 0, okay, currently it is not valid, all right, uh, because it's a cold, cold miss. So I must update the valid bit to one and load the tag information inside. All right, so I must put a value of uh, tag zero and I must put a value of one inside. Okay, now the important thing is where does this information at address four go to? The information at address four is B. All right, information at address four is B, okay? But where does this B go to? Does it go to word 0 or does it go to word 1? Uh, if you've done the tutorial, you know already. Uh, it should go to word 1. Okay, and not word 0. Okay, why word 1? Because I must read based on the allocation of the cache line. Okay, since my cache line is two words, my entire memory must be partitioned as two word block, okay, that reads into the cache. So when I read from cache, I read this as one block. I read this as one block, I read this as one block, and so on. Okay, so since address location four is part of the block that is together with word zero, okay, so word zero, sorry, word at address zero and address four will both be read as one line. Okay, so what you will get is A and B, word 0 and word 1. Okay, so that will be the first thing that happens. So after I read from the cache, then I take the data in word 1 and I transfer to my processor. Okay, now let's look at the second access, word at address 0. So address 0, again, you see that the mapping to index and tag gives me a index 0, tag is also 0, and now it is valid, okay? So the information is already in the cache, so I do not need to go out. So I can directly take from my cache and give it to my processor. Okay, the next one, address 8. In address 8 is index 1. Okay, so currently it is not valid. Okay, so it is a cold miss. So I need to read from the uh, read from the memory. So again, you have to see that the boundary is on a eight byte boundary. So eight and twelve data in address location eight and twelve will come together. So C and D will occupy word zero and word one. Okay. And subsequently, what will happen? You read from the word 0, which is address 8, and you give it to your processor. 
Next, you read from address 12. So when you read from address 12, you see that the data is already there, so it is considered a hit. So you will not have to read it one more time. Uh, you directly read from the cache. How about address location 36? Okay, so in address location 36, your index is 0, okay, but your tag is 1. Okay, so there is a conflict miss here, alright? Uh, there is a mismatch in the tag. So even though the data is valid, okay, and the index line point to zero, but the tag there is a mismatch, so it's a conflict mix. So I need to replace the cache, okay, with new data. Okay, so I need to update the tag plus at the same time read the information again. So here again you have to see carefully that it is the multiple of eight starts at thirty two and thirty six. Okay, so I need to read from address location 32 into word 0 and 36 into word 1. Okay, and then I read the word 1 which is J and give it to my processor. Okay, so similarly, if now I go back to now word 0 again. Okay, again index 0 but now tag 0. So again another miss, conflict miss. Okay, so I again need to update my cache again. Okay, then I read from the word 0 which is A and give back to my processor and the address location 4 is just inside my cache so I can take it from my uh, cache and give it to my processor. Okay, so this gives you uh, again a nice picture of exactly what is happening and you can see quite clearly that if I do this too, for example continuously, then what will happen? Okay, then I end up forever missing the cache, correct? Okay, so if I read from two address locations where the address is always alternating because the tag is always changing. Okay, the index is same line but tag is always changing, then I will always miss. I will always miss. So if I happen to access close by locations, then chances of hitting is higher, correct? So of course, then you may think that the chances of hitting are higher if I take more data in, correct? Okay, if instead of having two words, what if I have four words per line? Correct, if I have four words per line, then it means that there is more chances that if there is spatial locality, then I can hit nearby data more often, okay? So again, all these are trade-off decisions, correct? Okay, trade-off decision because depend on how much uh, space you have okay, to design this cache inside your processor. You have to remember the cache is part of your processor. It's not an external chip. Okay, so you need to play around with how much space you have to design this cache and put it inside. Okay, so in reality, in reality, there is always, there is two types of cache. Huh? If you look up any processor, you will see that there is, they call it I cache and D cache, instruction and data. Why? Because for example, when I run a loop, okay, I may execute the same set of instructions again and again, correct? But the data may be changing, correct? So the I cache may have higher hit rate compared to my D cache, okay? So by having two different types of cache, you can help to look out for different type of locality, okay? Instructions that are fetched regularly or data that is fetched regularly. Okay, so in reality, most processors now have two types of cache so that you can sort of uh, make the best of both, correct? Uh, if I fetch a lot of instructions within the loop again and again, I don't need to go out to memory because it's in the cache. If I deal with a set of data continuously, again, it's also in the cache, okay? So both of these help me to speed up my process time. Okay, so, so far, we talk about reading data, all right? Now let's look at writing data. Okay, so now I'm trying to do a store operation. Okay, so all the while we read. Okay, so when we read, we see what has happened. Now when we are writing, what is going to happen? So I'm going to store this data X to this location. So I see that it points to index 1. Okay, and the tag is 0, which is correct. And the offset is 8. So I need to update this value here. Correct. Okay, so I need to write a data to this 
location here. Okay. So what will happen? I suppose to write a x to the word two. So what is the problem here? The problem here is you have updated the cache, but you have not updated the memory. Correct? I have updated the cache, but you have not updated the main memory. You have to remember that right now is equivalent to you writing a store word instruction. Correct? So if I say store word is the S1 into something. Okay? So if I write a store word instruction, okay, then I'm expecting that this data in S1 is written to a memory location, right? Okay, it's updating a memory location given by S0 add with the offset here. Okay? But now what I've done is I've only written to the cache because I see that the cache has a valid entry in this address. Okay? So rightfully this is not complete yet. Okay, because the store word is supposed to write to the memory. I've only returned to the cache. So what can I do? So I need to have a write policy. How do I update the main memory when I have cache in between? Okay, so there is two possible ways of uh, going about this. One you call it write through cache, the other is called a write back cache. Okay, write through is to write data to both to cache and the main memory concurrently. Okay, and the write back is only write to cache and only write to main memory when the cache block is replaced. Okay, so let's look at the write through cache. When we write through cache, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to write to cache and memory together at the same time. Okay, but we know that writing to memory is always very slow, correct? We want to minimize that. Okay, so what can we do? Okay, what we can do is we can write to cache, which will be very fast. Okay, but we do not want to waste time for the write operation to memory to complete. All right? Okay, so what we can do is we can again make use of hardware solutions to help us. So we can write to a separate hardware buffer that will then copy this data for me to the memory independent of the processor. Okay. So again, this is not in your syllabus, but this is done generally through a system known as DMA. Uh, correct. Okay. Direct memory access. Okay. What is this DMA? This is a hardware block. Okay. Within the processor, that will help you to transfer data between the processor and the memory without without doing what. Without making use of your, uh, sorry, without slowing down the processor by, by freeing up the bus for the DMA. Okay, so if you look at this interface, okay, this interface here that connects the processor to the DRAM is basically two different bus, okay? So one is your address bus, okay, and the other is your data bus. Okay, when your processor connects to your external memory device, you are connecting it through two, two different buses, the address bus and the data bus. And interfacing through this bus is the slow process because your memory takes time okay, to respond and come back. Okay? So what the processor with a DMA, what can it do is, it can, you can program the DMA to say, I have this data that I want to write to this address location. You go and take care for me. I want to do other things. Okay, so when you program the DMA to do a memory access, the processor is freed up to do other things. Okay, provided what? Provided, uh, there's still a catch to it, provided it does not need to access the address and data bus. That means the information is already within the processor. Alright? Uh, if, the, if the things that the processor wants to do still depend on the bus, then you don't actually benefit much. Okay? So this thing helps provided the processor can be busy doing other things that are not dependent on the bus. Okay? So the DMA takes over the bus and does this transfer for you while the processor is freed up to do other things, uh, other computation, other processing within itself. Okay? So that is where if you have the data and the instruction within the cache, then it helps.
right? Uh, because I already have it in the processor, I'm not depending on my bus. Okay, so this is uh, one possible way of handling the write, which is write through. The other one is write back. Okay, the write back policy basically says that instead of writing back every time, okay, why don't we say that we write back only if the cache needs to be replaced? Okay, write only when the cache needs to be replaced. That means, okay, whenever I write to the cache, I have a dirty bit. So previously we have a valid bit, all right? Now I introduce another dirty bit. Okay, the valid bit is set whenever the data from the cache is, the data from the memory is read into the cache, okay? So I say it's valid, okay? Then when I update a content here, okay? So if I change it with the new data, then I say it is now dirty. So when the dirty bit is set, what does it tell us? It tells us that this data currently is inconsistent with my memory. Uh, this data is inconsistent with my memory because I've written to the cache, but I have not returned to my memory. So when do I update the memory? Only if the cache block is replaced. Okay, that means if there's another access where I point to this cache line and attack is a mismatch, correct? Then I know I need to replace this cache line. Okay, so if this cache line now needs to be replaced, before I replace it, I write to memory first, and then I read from the new memory location back to my cache. Okay, so that is the write back policy. So it depends on how your cache is designed you may choose one of these policies to do the write back or write through. Different processors have different. So even within Intel or any AMD, they have different uh, approaches to this. Okay, so now let's handle cache miss. Okay, so when we miss, we already know what happens. Okay, for a read, we have seen it a few times. When I try to read, and if the data is not in the cache, I load the data from the memory into my cache, and then load from the cache to my register, okay, or to my processor. In the write miss, what happens? If I try to write, and the data is not in the cache, I mean the address is not in the cache, then there is write allocate, which is to load into cache first, Okay, change the data in the cache and then write back. Okay, depend on the right policy. Okay, so what does that mean? That means I update my cache line not only for read but also for write. Okay, read means also I update the cache, write means also I update the cache. Okay, so if I try to write to a memory location and the memory location is not in my cache at all, okay, I may still go and read from the cache load it to my, uh, read, load, read from my memory, load it to my cache, and update my cache. From the cache, when does it go back to my memory? Depend on my policy. Okay, whether it's write back or write through. The other one is write around. That means, since I'm only writing to memory, I do not write to cache at all. I directly write to main memory. Okay, so again, these are just possible options. Okay, depending on how the designer decides to implement a particular policy for cache miss. Okay, so this shows you the summary. Okay, so effectively, if the write address is in cache, okay, we can write depending on write policy. So it's either I write directly to cache or uh, write to the write directly to memory or write to cache, and then I update based on the policy that I have, whether it's a dirty bit or write buffer. If I try to write and it's a miss, then what do I do? I depend on write miss policy. Okay, write allocate or write around. Write allocate means I read from memory back into my cache first and update in my cache. Write around means I go around the cache. It means I bypass the cache and go directly to my memory. Okay, so these are the different ways of cache. Okay, so in summary, we have seen, okay, uh, how 
the cache actually helps us okay, in improving the overall performance of a system. Okay? So you can see that cache is a very important part of every processor. So every processor out there definitely has some form of cache to help improve the overall performance. Okay? And like I said, uh, we did not cover set associative cache, but if you're interested, you can, you can read up on that. Okay? So that's the end. Okay, so I think in the tutorial questions, we have gone through some examples. Okay, so if not had the tutorial, then uh, you can go through the questions to see for yourself how you can actually use the address to map to a cache and see whether it's a hit or a miss and how do you deal with the hit and miss. Okay, so that wraps up our lectures.